We're coming to you today from the Psychedelic Science 2017 conference here in Oakland, California, where the world experts, scientists, researchers, doctors, medical professionals, psychologists, scholars are here spreading their wisdom and findings from their research about psychedelics in all forms, in all applications. And they're here to send a clear message to us that the psychedelics are a gateway for our consciousness to access new plateaus. Yeah, now that's what I'm talking about. Let's go check this out. We're here with Richard Hartnell with the Students for Sensible Drug Policy. Hello, Richard. Hi, thanks for uh, having us see here. What's going on on the campuses right now? Uh, same stuff is happening everywhere. Uh, a lot of students are really seeing, I mean, like I feel like we always have been able to, but now we're in this, uh, this era where the, the fact that we've been lied to about drugs and their effects uh, has been so obvious for so long that I think now everybody kind of takes for granted that our current narrative about drugs is just clearly false. And we're all kind of waiting around to see what can be done about it. Uh, students for Sensible Drug Policy is about getting students together to lobby for drug policy reform, uh, whether it's a really inter interdisciplinary group. So some of us are policy nerds and like law and political science. Uh, some of us are psychopharmacologists like myself. Um, some folks are in uh, counseling and psychiatry, psychotherapy. Uh, some of us are trying to get into research and uh, our field of research, um, I'm speaking as one of these students, is banned in the USA. The uh, research on these drugs is banned. They're Schedule One. You, you can't research them. Yeah, we have a situation in <laughs> so which we like we can't people... even learn about this thing that they're telling us is bad, but we can't even learn about it. Sure. Yeah, we have this. We have this paradigm in which people say, you know, with Schedule One, uh, the, the the definition of Schedule One under the Controlled Substances Act is that it has no recognized medicinal use. So we have people coming out showing that these substances have medicinal use and then going to the federal government, and the federal government says, well, sorry, but that obviously can't have a medicinal use because it's in the category of drugs that's, that says it has no medicinal use. And how did you test it anyway? By the way, you're under arrest. Yeah, right? we're, so we're stuck, you <laughs> yeah. know? Yeah, that is a tight spot. Right, I mean, yeah, I'm looking at a situation in which like, I, my field of research has been banned in the USA, so every grad school I applied to, they said, well, we can't have grad students working with these substances. And then I went and said, well, okay, well, I'll apply to these labs that are doing peripheral work. And they were like, well, sure, but we're only hiring people from within our discipline. So what do I do? My choice is either move out of the country or uh, take, you know, step sideways from research into policy, but then we're just not doing research, you know? So that's like the, that, that was kind of the argument that was being made in this, uh, in this last election was like, the USA is gonna fall behind. If, we, if we're too busy spending all of the school money on bullets, then we're not going to make the next Apple. It's going to come out of somewhere else. We're not going to have like the next internet or the next, uh, you know, uh, interstate or whatever, whatever it is. It's going to, it's going to empower people to really stay alive on the planet instead of poisoning ourselves or irradiating ourselves or blowing ourselves up. Boy, and uh, are these the types of enlightenments that we can gain and understand through the use of psychedelics? Is this what the consciousness expansion is all about, seeking and finding truth? I think so. To me, there are three ways that humanity is going to avoid going extinct, and we have to do all of them or we're going to go extinct. And the first is uh, solving the energy crisis, right? And that's for like the materials chemist people out there. Like they're working on solar and like wind and geothermal and, and I mean, even nuclear, I think like it's not a perfect technology. Like there's still all these discoveries that nuclear physicists are making all the time. Uh, quantum physics and subatomic physics and all that, who knows, you know, so they're, they're working on that. Uh, the second thing we have to figure out is um, is manufacturing. We have to decentralize the means of production from the bourgeoisie so that we can like take our lives back from the people who control what we're allowed to buy. Uh, and I think 3D printing is solving that, right? Now we have like the ability to just make whatever we want. Resources. Uh, to, a, to a degree, and that's increasing all the time. Even in healthcare, people are saying, well, instead of instead of never being able to afford a liver transplant, maybe you just print yourself a liver in your garage or in some medical you know, facility or something, and then you can just put that in. 
Uh, and then I think the third, the third prong of like really saving ourselves as a species is, is walking the so-called path of the heart. Like, it doesn't matter if we have all the energy and we can make whatever we want if all we want to do is make more plastic garbage. And bombs. And right, yeah, and bombs yeah. or whatever. So yeah. to me, I think that, that um, I'm kind of in Ram Dass's boat where like psychedelics are a way to instigate a process of like spiritual awakening or discovery. And then the rest is about figuring out how to cultivate that, that mind state of, of focus and compassion and uh, creativity while you're not like literally on drugs, right? So like sitting meditation, moving meditation, uh, like hard study, you know, math classes, like uh, learning how to cook, like interpersonal relationships and cultivating that kind of intelligence. It's super key. But I think that, um, I mean, it's like Ram Dass's teacher said, like when he took that, that, you know, historic dose of LSD, he thought, oh wow, I can see how Americans are into this because y'all don't have like a, a really codified, constant spiritual practice like yoga or whatever, right? We need that deep impact psychedelic experience for that quantum shift in our thinking. Yeah, you don't need it, but it sure doesn't seem to hurt. Well, I'm just saying without those other uh, practices that we don't really engage in here, then we need something. So this mm -hmm. is that alternative. Yeah, and this is all this is all like a personal take. Student for Sensible Drug Policy, as an organization, we neither officially condemn nor condone the use of certain drugs. Sure. Uh, what we do condemn are, uh, you know, the fact that a lot of the war on students. <laughs> yeah. Well, the problem is that the worst parts about drugs, the greatest harms of drugs in society, are due to prohibition. Right? Like you have like I mean, we just had a 420 party at the UC Santa Cruz campus. It's this like massive, unpermitted oh, event. It's great. Uh, it's a super good time. Yeah. Everybody shows up. But uh, the cops, they show up en masse and they sit at all of the four-way stops and they write tickets for people taking rolling stops at all the four-way stops all day. And if you give them, and that's already their excuse for searching your whole car and then they'll seize all your whatever. Even though, can, even though California passed uh, recreational cannabis, they use the pretense that the UC is a, uh, is a federally, is like federally controlled university, funded university, to write possession tickets anyway, which can wreck your financial aid. So to, to like try and show people that cannabis will ruin your life because it's drugs, they're just going out and ruining people's lives. With the message. With the message, exactly. And like with MDMA, you know, we, we don't condemn uh, going to a party and taking MDMA. We do condemn going to a party and getting permanent brain damage because you didn't test your drugs, right? So like a lot of chapters are caught up in, in creating like test before you ingest campaigns and letting students know that the majority of the drugs that they take, especially in white powder form, might be counterfeit. You know, if, this were, if MDMA were legal, then we wouldn't have, and it's exactly dosed. like alcohol pro yeah. prohibition. You know, if this were a over-the-counter product or a prescribed product, you would have product labeling, you'd have quality standards, you know, and it's exactly like alcohol prohibition where people, you know, it was banned, but people, people didn't stop doing it. And then what you had were hack chemists doing a bad job making alcohol. Then you have methanol in your bottle of booze and you go blind drinking it, you know? Yeah. Like now, nobody does that because we have product labeling and like alcohol the production and distribution is controlled enough you can look and be like, hey man, you can't make alcohol and sell it on the market unless we know that your product isn't going to make people blind. And if it says 80 proof, it's 40% alcohol. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Boy, oh boy. So what's it going to take to bring us around to, to the enlightenment to recognize the benefit and the power and the value of these substances? I think recruiting and getting more people out of the closet is really key. Oh, uh, yes, it's, it's out funny. of the closet. If you're doing psychedelics, Please let people know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, at, at Santa Cruz, it's funny because everybody smokes weed and nobody cares, right? Yeah. Uh, and it's uh, what's funny is that our chapter has like come and gone um, because I feel like a lot of people at a place like Santa Cruz, they just don't they just don't care about drug policy advocacy because it doesn't affect them imminently, right? Especially on like uh, you know, UCSE has a, a very, I think it's two point eight African American students on campus percent. Yeah. Uh, there's not 2.8 students, there's 2.8% of the student body is African American. Uh, so you have a lot of like basically like white kids who smoke weed who have never been like, you know, followed down the street by a police Mask officer weed, yeah. and like searched, you know, for a ba over a bag of weed or whatever. It's just not a big deal to them. Like you're not going to get caught, you're not going to get shaken down. Uh, most of the time we do have students coming to us and saying like, hey, I got a possession ticket. How, how the hell can I get a possession ticket for cannabis in California at a university campus? This wasn't in 2017, was it? Oh boy. Yeah. These are campus cops? Uh, yeah, yeah. And a lot of folks, like every student on that campus has checked the box on their financial aid form that says, like, I know that if I get a possession ticket, I can lose my financial aid. So nobody wants to come out of the closet and say, like, I'm going to join the drugs club because drug prohibition is completely messed up, right? Whereas in Kentucky or whatever, they have people really getting ruined 
uh, by these policies, trap. and they, they are lobbying like twice as hard as we are in California sometimes because like the Californians are like, well, yeah, I got my prescription, so like whatever, I can get away with smoking as much weed as I want, you know. Richard, what do psychedelics have the potential to do for mankind? Oh man, what do psychedelics have the potential to do? Uh, I mean, I just came from a bunch of panels at this conference about about psychedelic research, and that's my that's really my future. You know, I want to I have a head for science, so I want to do the research that people can use to leverage Congress to be like, look, clearly this has a medicinal use, uh, and I how think. About- how about the big, the big potential, the across the board, not just the people suffering PTSD or depression, but, but across the board. I'm a big fan of, uh, of Bob Jesse's uh, slogan about psychedelics being used both for the treatment of sick people and for the betterment of well people. Uh, I personally see psychedelics as a kind of sacrament, and I see it as, it as much a sacrament as I see uh, movement practice or like the practice I get relating to other people and like intimate relationships, you know? Uh, it's just another way of like checking myself with like the greater cosmos to find out like whether you know how I'm doing, whether I'm bullshitting myself or people around me or whatever, right? Beautiful. And to have that immediate, uh, that imminent experience of of uh, connectedness and communion with like source or God or whatever you want to call it. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I mean it's clearly beneficial. And you look at all of the old studies. You know, you have these these. We're like in the lab breaking our necks to figure out how to demonstrate the, uh, the power of the spiritual experience as induced by psychedelics. Whereas for decades, people have been doing research about the positive benefits of like religious practice and deep religious practice, right? And Bob Jesse also gave this, uh, this interesting talk about like the nature of religion. And when you get into a room with people like at this conference and you say like religion, people think like, oh, prohibition and like uh, racism and like col- uh, colonialism and dogma and homophobia and whatever any kind of divisiveness right but they don't but like the that's a reaction that comes from an understanding of like the bastardization of religion and not like religion at its heart which is about communion and source like my my first psychedelic trip ever i thought like oh my god it all is holy and miraculous and i found a way to have an immediate experience of all of this being holy and miraculous without having to like hate on gay people or like stop eating a certain food or whatever unless I want to for other conscientious reasons you know like so you can have yeah you can have these like these experiences and then to realize I mean yeah obviously there's something like imminently personally important about realizing that like I'm you and you're me and that like we're you know it solves it solves the the body mind problem it solves the 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 problem of dualism you know to realize that you're like a crunched up collection of cosmic stuff that is so complicated and organized that that like you like the piece of the universe that is you has this experience and is this this vessel by which the universe can experience itself subjectively like through our eyes through our perspective that's the goods that's the sauce right there you know and yeah to like go and and be able to touch that and to induce that personally uh, I mean yeah why who would be against that Let's keep the sauce flowing, man. Let's just keep making more sauce. Right. Let's and of course, set and setting, set and setting uh, notwithstanding, of course. Well, of course. Yeah. My friend, we're so grateful. It's great talking to you, Richard. Despite being in a chair, at now sure love, we always love to wrap with a hug. Oh, for sure. Yeah, West Coast style, right? Yeah.